Hi everyone, welcome back to Watch It Played Table Talk Talk Back. My name is Rodney Smith, and I must confess I do have a pretty high tolerance for cumbersome titles. But from now on we will refer to this segment as Table Talk Back, which I'm sure many of you will appreciate. Many of you also seem to appreciate uh, my amusement with alliteration, so I want to give full marks to Lucas McDaniel for providing this little anecdote to describe that situation where I talked about having a grumpy gamer at the table and playing poorly so that they don't complain and ruin the experience for everyone else. He came up with this phrase, purposefully playing poorly prevents player pouting past playtime. <laughs> well done, Lucas. And let's take a look at what Lucas has to say on this topic. Actually, let me summarize because it will be a little bit briefer. He indicates that you may have a couple, maybe a husband and wife, who basically know that if one crosses the other, even in just the game, that's going to bleed out into their real-life relationship, possibly with some hurt feelings, some grudges that may last for a few days or weeks. So they agree to never directly attack one another unless the game provides them with no option. Lucas says, in his mind, this is more of a house rule than really cheating. The thing that really jumped out to me here was the notion of a house rule, because I I do house rules as well on occasion. It doesn't bother me to think that players do this. And in this case particularly, both players are sitting down and agreeing in advance to play suboptimally. Now I'd like to read two comments back to back. Uh, Daniel Moritz says, I think most gamers will only purposefully play poorly when they feel they have some sort of unfair advantage over the other players. I have purposefully played poorly on some trivia type games when I've realized I remember the question on the card from a past playthrough. In that case, I might hesitate before jumping in with the answer to give someone else a chance to get it first. And Paul Bach says, I wouldn't call it playing poorly so much as self-handicapping in order to level the playing field. Although I can't reply to all of the responses, I really do read all of them. And it's comments like these by Paul and Daniel and many of you as well that get me thinking about my initial position in those Table Talk episodes and really challenging it a little bit. I, I stated that I felt rule books have an unwritten rule, if it's not stated explicitly, that players are supposed to be trying to win. And that when they don't do that, then they are basically, if not breaking the rules, then they are certainly breaking the intention of the game. But this raises another point. There's another intention, I believe, in games, and that is that they're meant to be played by players of relatively the same skill level. Now, obviously, that's not always going to happen. But if you think about it, a game designer can't really and shouldn't really design their game with the idea that it's going to be played by someone who has no idea what they're doing and someone who has a hundred plays under their belt. Obviously, that's going to happen, but that's not how the game should be designed to try to account for those situations. Hopefully, over time, the players get to relatively the same level of skill and, and therefore can then fully enjoy the game as it's meant to be played. But what do you do until that point happens? And I think it does make a kind of sense in those situations to potentially handicap yourself. At the very least, it would be wrong for me or somebody else to say you're, you're breaking the intentions of the game when you do it for that purpose. So again, you guys have really given me something to think about there, which, which I think is great. So let me give you something else here. Mike Grummert says, the very fact that you are making choices that take into consideration others' feelings makes it qualitatively different from cheating. I, I did try to draw a correlation between playing poorly on purpose and cheating, but it was really more the feelings that can result from it, the outcomes, the impact it can have on the gameplay, and, and how those things can be similar. I really don't mean to imply that when you play poorly, and you do it intentionally, that you are doing it in the same spirit uh, as someone who's cheating. I really do think they are different things from that level. So I'm glad you brought that up because I wouldn't want someone to walk away with the impression that I'm saying, if you ever played nice to your kids or to someone who's new to the game, then I'm calling you a cheater. Um, so, so thanks for bringing that up and allowing me to highlight that. Knacker Blue Rider says, I do worry that avoiding irritating the grumpy gamer just contributes in some way to the problem. It feels wrong to me that having a bad attitude should pro-offer any sort of advantage. What if it wasn't just you at the table holding back? Eventually the presence of that player makes the game less enjoyable for everyone if they continue to play that way. Knacker, I agree with you. I talked about how sometimes I'll allow that grumpy gamer to influence my gameplay. 
But really, you know, as you suggest, two wrongs don't make a right. And it's probably better that more than just me is feeling uncomfortable at the table because that means, as a gaming group, we can address that situation if it really does get out of hand. So, Revya Raksha says, I play poorly all the time. It confuses your opponents and makes it hard for people to predict you in future games. It's a short-term setback for long-term success. When I first read that, I thought, hmm, I don't know how comfortable I feel with that approach. But then I went on and I read this comment by somebody else. Robin Lee says, In games like Resistance, I purposefully play dumb, but that was part of my game plan, to throw the others off my scent. You know, that really did help me understand Revia's position a little better because there's certainly been games, especially where diplomacy is involved, where I will purposefully play poorly to try to take the target off my back, or maybe I'll give someone a really good trade so they think I'm their friend and then later on I can stab them in the back <laughs> and hopefully try to win. So yeah, sometimes playing poorly is really part of the intended gameplay. JC Tritz has put it this way, Playing poorly on purpose is what I consider the board gamer's bluff, an upper division strategy to gain the upper hand in the game. And you know, I really, when I thought about that, again, you guys are making me think about stuff that I, I didn't at first consider, and really, that is definitely, and certainly in those kinds of games, part of the intended play. Tolerus Sumnolent said, the only exception to this rule of always trying to play your best, to me, is when I am GMing a role-playing game for the group where I like to cheat fate now and then, you know, behind the GM screen, if necessary, never to my advantage then. So this would be where maybe you roll a die and the monster would like maybe kill a player, but that's going to really break the gameplay experience. So instead, the person running the game says, oh, no, no, you, uh, the, the enemy missed and you're fine. You know, I really do agree because those games, especially role-playing games, they have it right in the rule books that the, the game master is intended to try to create a fun gaming experience and should bend the rules without breaking them where those situations would be better served by by playing suboptimally. Yuiji said, I won't ever truly play poorly when introducing someone new to a game, but I will be very open as to my mental processes and explain why I make certain moves, what risks I'm taking, or what strategies I'm trying to develop. Ultimately, gaming for me isn't about winning or losing, it's about making sure everyone enjoys themselves without being frustrated. Yuichi, I think that's a great approach and an even better philosophy. Once again, you guys have given lots of things to think about. I really appreciate that. There's a lot to think about here. We probably can't really cover it all, but I think one thing that was prevalently mentioned by several of you is that we, we do often go a little easier on our significant others, whether that's a boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, or wife, <laughs> in the hopes that they will want to play with us. Again, Yuichi even found a, a very clever way of summing up the, the problem as I presented it when he wrote, Our proprietor from the present presents the perplexities and possibilities of purposefully playing poorly with peers in a prudent and punctual production. <laughs> well, thank you both for the compliment, of course, and the creative alliteration. Now I'd like to share with you a few clips from our wonderful video responses. You can find them if you go back to the original Table Talk episodes. They're fully there if you want to watch them. Until the next episode, though, thanks for watching. It really depends on the game and the people playing the game. Usually for my gaming group, and since I know that they've played a lot of games, I usually don't need to tone down my level of play. I usually don't win anyway. If I have a clear advantage over someone else who's new to the game, I would definitely tone down my gameplay. Um, otherwise, I don't want to... Uh, beat them by a gazillion points or something that might make them not really like the game that I like so um, That's my little secret Sometimes I let people win But not all the time Thanks for watching and <laughs> see you So you have to choose if your goal is to just hang out and for the social interaction of the game Let's say you just want to hang out with those people, then you have to prioritize. If it's for the social interaction, playing bad doesn't really matter because you're not really there for the game anyway. As a gamer, I think that playing purposely bad now in my experience is not a good thing. And you have to say that either we play a game like Gloom, which the winning doesn't really matter, or either just that or 
don't play, find some other activity. Why be miserable, basically? And I think fun is the fundamental principle leading to the acceptance of playing poorly or not playing poorly. In a more serious competition, like for instance in official um, um, uh, competitions, tournaments, for instance, I think um, playing poorly is uh, next to cheating, but not exactly cheating. And cheating is the key word here. This was your second question. Is playing poorly the same as uh, cheating? I say it is not the same. Playing poorly is the opposite. It's kind of, um, if you like, a cheating with an altruistic um, implication. You uh, choose to play not uh, the, the hard gaming style, in order to give other gamers the opportunity to actually win the game or to have some kind of a very good feeling during the gameplay. I don't know if this is something that would be uh, or could be considered as kind of a fair play or something, um, but at least I'm pretty sure that this is not the same as cheating. If I'm teaching some new players and I'm playing a game that has like some sort of mechanic, like you know, Carcassonne has tile placement, you're trying to place your tiles right and get the most score, but there is player interaction and you can absolutely backstab someone and steal a ton of points from them if you play the right stuff. So games that, that mix those two things, I'm definitely light on the player for the first time. That being said, I think the best way that I've found handling new players and not having to do that sort of playing poorly mechanic is just letting everybody know things. Like, I'm very vocal about what they should be doing on their first turn. Like, you know what? Just, just so you know, you could play that piece here and it's going to take away... It's, it's going to drop all my cards and I'm going to lose this and it's that's a really strong thing. And I'll just tell them that flat out that this is a good move for a player. You, you could knock me out or next turn when it comes back to me I'm going to slam you if you don't play this card. And I'll just let people know that openly I instead. So that kind of, sure that's not playing my best. I'm giving open information to them to say here's how you can beat me. But I think you kind of need that in certain games. It, especially with new players. Ooh, let me see. What should I do here? I draw a card. Oh, I think I can make it. I play the hat. Yay! My first game of Cartagena, and I win. This is the best game ever. Yay!